So what if I were to ask you to rate your happiness on a scale of one to seven? One being miserable and seven being as happy as possible. So just right now, by a show of hands, raise your hand if you think you're about a six or a seven, so very happy. Okay, brilliant. Most of you, maybe three quarters. Now, how do you think the response would be different if we asked African children the same question? My name's Tim, and I'm trying to learn what makes kids happy. I think it's important, and so do adults. As much as most of us don't like to admit it, our parents probably know what's best for us. So researchers asked 10,000 adults from 48 countries and six different continents about what they wanted most for their children. Happiness was the overwhelming response. Happiness, something so simple and personal, yet so desirable and sought after. So what better place to begin answering these questions of children's happiness than in Zambia, a landlocked country of 13 million lovely people in South Central Africa. I first traveled to Zambia 16 months ago on a project to create school soccer clubs in rural communities. Local health and education providers were concerned about youth as there's a lack of positive extracurricular activities. And this, this decrease in good options was resulting in poor choices like early teenage sexual experimentation. We thought that by giving kids the opportunity to participate in soccer, to engage in sport, we could prevent the less desirable activities while promoting positive qualities like hard work, team play, and gender equality. Now, as we know about struggling African nations, youth aren't the only need. This is a scale of the United Nations Human Development Index, a composite measure that ranks countries around the world based on their life expectancy, income, and education. Norway comes in as number one. Congo's last. Canada's the ranked as the sixth best country in the world to live in. But Zambia is a country that ranks 164. A country where the average life expectancy is just 40 years. Probably the same age as many of your parents. The same age as youngsters like Justin Trudeau and Shaquille O'Neal. A country where one of every five adults is infected with HIV AIDS. Now these numbers are setting the stage for a pretty sad story. But hold on, because in Zambia, yeah, I was shocked by what surrounded me. Shocked in a good way. By our standards, the children really had nothing. One school for kids orphaned by HIV and TB were really dependent on charities. And while this charity's budget was slashed back in Britain, the kids in Zambia didn't eat properly. All the school could afford to feed them was cabbage and shima, or cornmeal. But their portions are about half of what most of you are about to eat for lunch. But for many of these kids, this was their only meal of the day. But that didn't seem to dampen their spirits. We played soccer for hours, or for days. But not the soccer we're used to. Instead, we played barefoot on a sandy, rocky pitch in 42 degree heat. Conditions that most of us Canadian kids would scoff at playing in. And these circumstances, combined with this glamorous perception of America, led to some interesting conversations. One child grabbed me and he said, Sir, will you take me back to Canada? Will you take me with you, sir? I tried to explain that even though we have nicer roads, modern buildings, and the latest technology, I didn't find people to be any happier. They said they were envious of my pale white skin. So again, I tried explaining how white people are rarely pleased with the color of their own skin. Instead, they spend money, risk radiation and skin cancer to darken their skin, to change their look. And throughout all these conversations, I began to notice a common theme. Somehow, our Western world luxuries, items that our culture praised, the things we work for, and measure our success by, weren't contributing to our overall goals, our desires of well-being. So what was different about Zambians? Why were they so happy? I returned nine months later to investigate my observations about the children's happiness more scientifically. Now, traditionally, sciences like medicine and psychology 
have long been focused on studying the model of what's wrong with you and how do we fix it. And these scientists have made critical, life-saving contributions. But my professor and I are asking a different question. Instead of asking what is wrong with you and how do we fix it, we're asking what is right with you and how do we make it even better. And this newer approach to science and health is known as positive psychology. It focuses on identifying factors that contribute to our positive well-being. But so far, positive psychology has mainly studied wealthy adults. And the predictors of adults' happiness don't always contribute to children's happiness. So for example, uh, we don't care about marriages, marriages or careers. They're important to adults' happiness, but not ours. So scientists know little about what makes children happy, but they know almost nothing about what makes children from different cultures happy. Now, just a minute ago, I shared some discouraging numbers about Zambia that in some ways you may have even expected. Because we know about Africa. Uh, our perceptions of this continent are shaped by Hollywood and media, which tend to focus on the negativity of Africa and its people. We're well informed of the violence, the corruption, the poverty, the unemployment, the disease, so much so that we hear ignorant and naive declarations that we should abandon aid and humanitarian efforts and let the circumstances run their course. But being immersed in their culture, you realize how generous, peaceful, and beautiful these people really are. I was overwhelmed by their strength and resiliency. When you actually work with the kids, sometimes it's hard to see the problems. I see strength. So I wanted to instead focus on a good news story from Africa by finding out what's right with them through positive psychology. Positive psychology and well-being are about several things. They include happiness, life satisfaction, and hope. And we can measure these things. A happiness is how we feel about our lives. Life satisfaction is how we think about our lives. And hope is how we feel and think about our futures. These small nuances make each of these three concepts distinguishable. So for example, Daniel might be feeling happy right now because he just shared breakfast and laughs with his best friend. Whereas Gilbert might be feeling hopeful because he just submitted his application for his first job and he's feeling pretty good about it. Together, happiness, life satisfaction, and hope are large parts of what make life worth living. So we wanted to measure them in Zambian children. So I took our questionnaires to Zambia and asked nearly 1,400 children to complete a survey on their happiness, life satisfaction, and hope. I also asked them other questions about other things that were going on in their lives, things we suspected might be influencing their well-being. So imagine your happiness like a great big pie. What are the different pieces of the pie, and how big is each piece? Previous studies identified these as potential factors that influence happiness. So health is your personal and family health and disease prevalence. By religion, I mean practicing the actual rituals, praying, reading the Bible, going to church, as opposed to spirituality, which is more the belief in feeling mindful or connected to something greater, the belief in a soul, having faith. So for some people, religion's a route to spirituality. Nature, how connected you are to the natural environment and the outdoors. Relationships are with friends and family, your social circles, having a sense of belonging through community and collectivism, and possibly wealth, how rich you are and the luxuries you can afford. Now, I took a few measures of happiness, but let me show you one that's simple and easy to understand because they all told the same story. This scale is a series of variations in the mouths. Of course, the mouth turned downwards indicates unhappiness, and the mouth turned upwards indicates happiness. Using this scale, we ask children to tell us how they feel most of the time, at home, at school, at church. We also use the scale in Kelowna, BC. Now, Kelowna is among the wealthiest cities in one of the wealthiest countries, and children there are happy. Just 3% indicated that they were unhappy 
by responding in the bottom three categories. And 71% said that they were very happy by answering in the top two. In Zambia, a country, a, an extreme example of children admits adversity, an identical 3% responded unhappiness in the bottom three, and 69% said that they were very happy, six or seven. So statistically, there is no difference in reported happiness between children in Canada and children in Zambia. And I think there's something we learned from both populations here. Surely the child who asked me to bring him from Zambia back to Canada didn't expect the reported happiness levels to be comparable. And probably neither did you. So what can we learn about their achievement of happiness in such a low resource environment? What does a happy child in Zambia look like? Their children who value their family, who have good friends, are more spiritual, love nature, and have a strong sense of community. They're not rich. Our results indicate that being rich is not essential to children's happiness. So maybe that piece of the pie doesn't exist. I challenge you today to form your own conclusions, to identify the ingredients of your own happiness pie. Just don't let society or media or the values of our culture dictate your goals. Maybe we should be more like the children in Zambia. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.